23. Paul's Ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 to 27. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die, than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but run receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. This is not a popular text. Paul here is answering the criticisms of his ministry, as he does elsewhere in Corinthians, both the first and second letters. And people tend to go over these passages quickly or to ignore them, or not to preach about them. Why is that wrong? Why is it important that we pay attention to such passages in Paul's letters? Paul, in his missionary work, preached at his own expense, earning his keep as a tent maker, which meant mainly a worker in leather, because tents were made of leather. Paul came from a wealthy family, but the Jewish premise was that if a man did not teach his son a trade, he taught him to be a thief. Paul's comments in verses 15 to 18 have been called somewhat, quote-unquote, obscure, and with good reason. Other men might readily exercise their position to command financial support, as God's law clearly entitles them to, but Paul wants his freedom to be able to speak more freely and more clearly. He glories in his independence from them, because it enables him to speak and teach more freely. Verse 15 Paul claims no credit for a foregoing pay. He could do nothing else, given his convictions. His call to the ministry required this of him. Verse 16 Paul does not tell us precisely why this is so, nor is he under any obligation to do so. His call is so powerful a one that he was impelled to be under no command from men, only from the Lord. Verses 16 and 17. God's judgments would overwhelm him if he did not preach, and he therefore wasted no accountability to anyone other than Jesus Christ. Verse 18. And he is afraid that he will abuse his power in the gospel if he does not preach freely. Preaching for Paul is obligatory. It is God's mandate from heaven. Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 22. Preaching for Paul is both his calling and his life, a privilege and a necessity. In his view, to require pay for his preaching would be an abuse of his power, although it was a legitimate requirement that he be supported. Verses 17 and 18 Paul has thereby made himself free from all men and more fully Christ's servant. Verses 19 and 20 it was Paul's ministry to bring into sharp focus the conflict between Christianity and Judaism, on the one hand, 
and between a Christian view of God's law and the Pharisaic view on the other hand. He was thus in particular a target of hatred. Other apostles also faced and suffered martyrdom, but the animosity against Paul was particularly intense. This is still the case. Paul no more set aside the law than did Moses and Jesus. Among the Jews, he stressed his obedience to the law that he might make them understand much better that it is the way of sanctification, not justification. Because they were under the law, he came to the Jews as one faithful to the law, that I might gain the more. Verse 19. To the Gentiles, not knowing they were under God's law, but now by their conversion, under the law to Christ, Paul came with the good news of salvation through Christ's atonement, released from God's legal penalty of death, and sanctification by the law. Verse 21. Paul realistically approached Jews and Gentiles in terms of their backgrounds of understanding and ignorance, of sin and grace. His desire to save all governed him. Verse 22. He does this for the gospel's sake, in order to share the privileges of grace with them. Verse 23. In the Grecian athletic races, only one man won the prize among the several runners in the race. Paul urges them to run as men striving for a single prize. Verse 24. He wants none to meander in as though, because salvation is all of grace, no works are required. James chapter 2 verses 4 to 6. Such an attitude shows a lack of grace. In a race, men train and prepare to win a prize, a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Verse 25. Paul runs like a racer, that is, he trains and disciplines himself. His faith is no easy believism, but the urgency of a man whose life is racing and who disciplines his being in terms of this. Verses 26 and 27. The reference in verse 26, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, is to a boxer training, to shadow boxing. Paul insists that ours is never shadow boxing, but a serious struggle. If we feel, or if Paul should feel, it means becoming a castaway, laid on the shelf as no longer useful. The word translated into English as castaway refers, essentially, to a broken cup or a cracked cup, that is, a beautiful thing you don't want to throw into the trash heap, so you keep it on the shelf to put little odds and ends in. That is what it means to be a castaway. When Paul says, I keep under my body, verse 27, he means, I do not allow it to take control. This is no ascetic view, but simply a realistic recognition that an athlete in training must face the temptation to be lazy, to break training with self-indulgence. Paul believes in the perseverance of the saints, but he also believes in human responsibility. A man who holds that, Because he is saved in Christ, he can be self-indulgent and fear neither judgment nor hell, knows nothing about the faith. Those who are the chosen of God most manifest consistency of faith in life, and their zeal is a constantly renewed one. Paul always sees Jesus Christ as the one in whom the divine and the human purposes come together. In him, all things come into focus, And Paul's concern is that all who profess Christ display a like focus. Salvation has to do with much more than going to heaven. It requires the priority of God and his kingdom in our lives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It means that we now live for Christ and his reign rather than for ourselves. A telling book title of the 1920s spoke of God without thunder which is the kind of God most men want, that is, a God without judgment. Such a God does not exist. Precisely because the living God is a God of judgment, there is salvation and a separation from sin and death to life and righteousness or justice. Paul summons us to faithfulness to the living God as against the false gods of our own imagination. Why should such, quote, purely personal stuff be a part of the Bible? 
The reason is a very important one. We are persons, not abstractions. We are not to be reduced to reason, nor to an idea. We are persons, as Paul was, made by a totally personal God, the supreme person. Therefore, it is important in the eyes of God that the very personal reactions of a Jeremiah or of a Paul or any one of the saints be recorded. We are told that Jesus wept, that it grieved him to see the people in their waywardness because he was a person. It is a false spirituality that pushes some people to try to be above personhood. This is why passages like this occur throughout the Bible. God speaks to us, the supreme person, through persons, to our personal nature and needs. We cannot transcend personality, and it is an ancient Greek ideal to think so. We are persons, not abstractions. We are not to be reduced to reason or to an idea.